get involved with this case? In 1979, I walked into a bookstore and I saw Leon Grid Elder's photo book on the Meyer case. In 1986, a guy I met in a little cafe gave me almost 2,000 pages of transcripts of Meyer's conversations with the play Arm. So Mike, where are we going right now? We're going over to do a radio show uh, with Michael Parker at a radio show called Karma Air that broadcasts out of Hollywood, somewhere here on Sunset Boulevard, to discuss the Billy Meyer case. Hey, Mr. Warren, how are you? Come on in. I'm looking forward to this show because um, I, I've been in the UFO thing for a long time. Truth Seekers, how's it going? It is Michael Parker, and this is another episode of Dark Matter here on Karma Air. Billy Meyer case is not one that I have fully investigated, so I'm going to be learning today, just as you guys, plenty of, of adamant believers and plenty of staunch critics. So it's a amazing story, and uh, let's just cut straight to the chase. And uh, Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, Michael. Glad to be here. Billy Meyer is a uh, soon-to-be 70-year-old man living in Switzerland. Meyer has one arm. He lost his arm in about 1965. He started to take photographs of UFOs in 1964. He claims that his first contacts with extraterrestrials took place when he was only a five-year-old boy. That there is more photographic evidence and, and, and video evidence for this particular case than any other existing case. And it's, it's, it's almost so good that you're just like, holy cow. When he took a lot of this, this material, took these photos, there was no Photoshop. There were no home computers. If these had been hoaxes, his designs for these craft are quite interesting. These official contacts with extraterrestrials taking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs and films and everything else that followed, the skeptics would like us to believe that this man with no resources, working as a night watchman and on a partial disability pension, with one hand, he is not only a master model maker, filmmaker, photographer, digital and special effects person, videographer, metallurgist, electronics genius, sound recording engineer, knowledgeable about topography and map making, geography, ancient history, uh, mining, ores, agriculture, and 30 other disciplines that he's brought to bear in, in terms of the information in the, this case, they will credit him with that, but they won't say, hey, the guy's telling the truth, he's the one that's meeting with these people. In 1958, Meyer sent to the 25 European countries his, about 115, 120 specific predictions. The United States of America will be engaged in two wars with Iraq. The second war will be conducted under a president who is the son of a former president. The second war will lead to an unbelievable disaster. The end game is this, and this has been said even before we launched the war in Iraq pertaining to U.S. military policies. Unless the United States withdraws from all military bases and from all wars and stops sticking its nose in everybody else's business around the world, there will be a third world war which will eliminate three quarters of the population of the planet. It will devastate the North American continent. We will be among the hardest hit. All of our major cities will be destroyed. We are in for a bad time. And I said, Billy, I remember reading in the prophecies that Russia is said, it's a high likelihood Russia will invade Iran as well as Turkey and then go into Scandinavia and this and that. This is all stuff allegedly published thousands of years ago before we even knew about a Russia. And I said, but now America and Israel are talking about attacking Iran. And he said, well, I'll tell you this. If your country attacks Iran, there's an enormous likelihood that Russia and China, which are becoming closer all the time, will attack your country. And that's actually been spoken about as a possibility for a while. It's already in prophecies that they published years ago that I even put in one of my newsletters. Of course, that's bothered a lot of people. but. They should also be bothered that Meyer has spoken very harshly about radical Islam, Russia, China, you know, laundry list. He was also told uh, in January 2005 that AIDS has mutated and taken some new forms that are fast acting and produce from the HIV full blown AIDS within a matter of weeks. Now they've also said that there would be a cure for AIDS coming, that there would be a vaccine that would either occur or be in development by 2006. I haven't heard an update on what that is, but with the new, this problem with the new strains of AIDS, uh, they've just said very you know, clearly this is something that uh, 
you, your scientists don't know as much as they think they know about most matters. The case is so full of prophetic, predictive information that wherever you can actually check and see, did it happen, is this what's happening? Okay, it happened. Are the details the same? Yeah, the details are the same. Well, who published it first? In every case but one that I know of, Meyer published it first. We are here on Earth to lead our lives because our consciousness must be developed so that it gathers knowledge, gathers wisdom, builds up love, peace, freedom and harmony. The human exists in the material life on Earth in order to learn, just as other humankinds do on other worlds in the entire universe. My name is Edward Albert Meyer, but all around the world I am simply called Billy. I received the name in Tehran when I was on the road, and since then this name has remained with me. I'd say, in and of itself, my childhood was very good and very pleasant for me. I learned very much on the one hand because of my parents, and on the other hand because of an extraterrestrial called Svath, whom I got to know in 1942. How old were you then? I was five years old. And this man, Svath, taught me very much of my school knowledge, besides many other things, just as Pastor Emanuel Zimmerman did. Then I confided in the pastor, and he told me I did not need to be afraid. He explained to me what telepathy is. Whenever I ran off, Svath helped me to hide somewhere, or he took me in his spaceship, and he flew somewhere with me where we could talk and where I could learn from him. Neurolinguistic programming, neuro standing for how you take the world in through your five senses. Uh, linguistic is how that is communicated internally to you. And then programming is how do we change those internal communications so that we can take the world in differently. NLP was started in 1975, um, basically modeling some therapists. And now, today, it's really used much more as far as in the business community. So the skills of neurolinguistic programming are pretty much pervasive in healthcare and education um, in a lot of different places. What I'm noticing is here, here is that he is looking down to his right a lot. And when people are looked down to their right, very often they're accessing emotions. They're accessing aspects of, of um, what's going on from an emotional sense. He's also looking down a little bit to his left, which would be his analytical mind. So, but most of this is looking down to his emotional self. It looks like he's talking pretty slow um, at a nice pace. So that would be congruent with his, him speaking from his heart. His eyes, however, are blinking quite a bit. And that could be an indication as far from a body language point of view that that he's actually not being congruent, that there's some nervousness there. However, if he is intelligent, that also may account for that and counter it. While the attacks on me and other people have been really relatively tame compared to what's been directed at Meyer, they've really only encouraged me to keep on going and get to the bottom of the story. So Michael, where are we right now? We've just arrived at the Aquarius Hotel and Casino in lovely Laughlin, Nevada. Uh, we're the home of the International UFO Congress, where we're going to do our little presentation on Friday. To present some of the new information on the Billy Meyer case, there's, there's always new translations that are being made available on materials, some of which dates back 50 years or more. Uh, Meyer had a, an interesting childhood, to say the least. Some of it he, he considered to be very, very 
positive, but some of it was enormously difficult for him. He had, uh, since his earlier contact experiences with this man Svath, it developed in him a, uh, a duality, if you will, of the private inner life, the private life of his communications, and then being very alienated from other children and other people because he couldn't express, he couldn't tell them anything about this. He uh, had support from a parish priest, Father Zimmerman. And Father Zimmerman became a confidant. Uh, he had actually been contacted, apparently telepathically, by the play Aaron to prepare him to be uh, a source of help for young Meyer, who they told him would come to him. There was one situation where a woman had been abusive beating him. At some point, she hits him, slaps him, I think, with a wet towel that he then takes away from her and slaps her with this towel. This gets him incarcerated for a period of time in a, in a youth prison. Then, after he's out of that situation, seems to attract repeated accusations of wrongdoing things that he didn't do, but he doesn't defend himself, he doesn't put up any kind of a fight about it, ends up again being incarcerated. He escapes from this facility, and in the process I think he breaks a bone in his foot, injures himself. He goes and joins the French Foreign Legion. We're talking about somebody who's 15 or 16 years of age. I joined the French Foreign Legion because I simply wanted to leave everything behind me, the false accusations and so forth. I wanted to elude the court. And then when I was in the Legion, I came to the conclusion that that was not the correct way. He found himself with people who loved to kill and who were trained to become better and better killers. It was not something that was his calling and he escaped. He did something quite unusual. He walked out across the desert, left the French Foreign Legion behind him. That's why I returned to Switzerland and I gave myself up to the authorities who locked me up in an institution for more than two years. He learns a variety of different skills. He's befriended by one or more people there who want to assist him and help him in his, his development, his life. He's a young person still. And many of these skills he would learn uh, in prison, he would employ and use later in life in various ways. In each case, I financed the travels by working underway, as is customary and right, to honestly make my way through life. Now and then, Svath also took me to various government people who I met and with whom I could speak, and indeed, through a speech translator, the small translation device which had been fastened on my belt or breast pocket, and so each time I could have a conversation with the concerned person without problems. Svath had previously been with each of these people who he had introduced to me. He had had conversations with them and he was known by them as an extraterrestrial. There were various persons, for example, Gandhi in India, Farouk down in Egypt, and in Abyssinia in today's Ethiopia, I met Selassie. So you ready for the speech, presentation? Pretty much. I, I, it, um, it's not something I rehearse exactly. I just lay out my bullet points and things will be on the screen and then tell the stories like uh, and he covered 142,000 miles on foot hitchhiking, uh, worked something like 360 different jobs uh, from, from uh, the dog catcher to snake handler, private detective. Uh, for a while he was known as the Phantom. The Phantom? Yeah. He was employed by some Middle Eastern police departments to bring in serial killers and mass murderers. He had his Swiss leather jacket on with a Swiss cross and an Arab headdress. Well, maybe he could find Osama. <laughs> yeah, nobody else seems to be able to do it. It's funny you say that because uh, Meyer actually met Saddam Hussein when he was an up-and-coming thug. Saddam Hussein habe ich auf einer meiner Reisen kennengelernt. I met Saddam Hussein during one of my travels down in Baghdad. At that time, he was about the same age as I was, about 22 years old, I think. I don't know any more precisely because it was a long time ago. He was already someone who had turned to crime and who said that if he could one day somehow take control, he would do everything to be recognized by the people, even if he had to play the role of a holy person.
When Svath died in the early 50s, I was contacted by a female voice. A short time later, a young woman named Askit appeared who then took up contact with me. And these contacts lasted for another 11 years. What we're told in this case is that Billy Meyer has been the contact person chosen by these extraterrestrial human beings for a very specific purpose, and that is to bring to our world once again what they call the true teachings of creation. The Pleiaran are said to be extraterrestrial human beings who live in a star system that is in the direction of the Pleiades star system that we can see in our night sky. The common portrayal of extraterrestrials as little green men or little gray people is part of a disinformation campaign. We're told that there are so many extraterrestrial human races in the universe that uh, we would be surprised. Often when people feel vulnerable or small or powerless, and there are times in all of our lives that we do, it's very uh, comforting to believe in something bigger and better than you, a power, for example, an extraterrestrial that knows more than you do, that can predict the future, that can take away the uncertainty. There are a lot of schizotypal people who do believe in UFOs and do believe that uh, we've been contacted by extraterrestrials. There is also something called a delusional disorder which is considered a psychotic disorder, but it's very interesting. People who have this disorder are, appear very normal, except for a very compartmentalized delusion that they have, like that they have a relationship with extraterrestrials. Other than that, they function, you know, pretty well. Do you see yourself as a missionary of Billy Meyer? I hope not in the, in the sense of the word that I understand it. I feel a, a sense of mission. Uh, does that make me a missionary? I hope not. Uh, What's wrong with being a missionary? Well, I don't want to knock on doors and tell people how they should think and how they should behave and what they should believe and that they should believe anything in particular. What I do want to do in my presentation, my personal work, is to say, please look at this, please consider this, think about this, this is what's alleged, this is what we claim we can prove, this is what's still speculative. What does this mean? It's a non-bizarre delusion. So you ask the question, what's a bizarre delusion versus what's a non-bizarre delusion? A non-bizarre delusion could very well be that extraterrestrials have contacted somebody, but the person might be uh, diagnosed with delusional disorder. Again, it doesn't mean it's not true. And this is where things get ambiguous. So, you know, I for one can live with the ambiguity of it. Um, I'd kind of like to think that you know, extraterrestrials have contacted us. I'd like to believe that and I'd like to see the evidence. Together with Asket, I traveled around and was also able to make various trips into the past with her and also into the future, but I don't want to talk about the travels into the future. I not only told friends, but also other people about the future, and some of them even misused that information and tried to make money from it and were sentenced and imprisoned. If a person could really know the future, it would be probably an enormous burden, depending on what we're talking about. But certainly if you saw events that were going to occur with certainties, however that would be possible, and these were negative events, disasters, etc., uh, that would be a terribly disturbing thing, knowing that one could not uh, change or alter that would be enormously frustrating. He claims to have met a man called Emmanuel, and Emmanuel, according to the information in the case, would be the man who we know as Jesus Christ, or at least the Jesus Christ figure would be, according to the Meyer material, a fictionalized version of a real man who lived 2,000 and some years ago, who indeed was crucified, but survived the crucifixion. Als Emmanuel gelebt hat, der 
When Emmanuel lived, who was later falsely named Jesus Christ, and who never had anything to do with the religion which was made from his teaching. Emmanuel was not an extraterrestrial. He was therefore a human being from this world, begotten by an extraterrestrial with a terrestrial woman named Mary, and was born here on the earth as an earth human. Und hier auf der Erde als Erdenmensch geboren. Und warum hat Asket dich, uh, And why did Asket present you to him? Uh, I don't actually want to say anything about that. Uh, what is the Talmud of Emmanuel? The Talmud of Emmanuel is a document. It came about when Billy Meyer and Isa Rashid, who was a former Greek Orthodox priest, were led telepathically to an area outside of Jerusalem by the Pleiaren, and they found and dug their way into an abandoned ancient tomb. The stones on the floor, concealed for a while, for 2,000 years apparently, resin-encrusted, animal skin-wrapped scrolls, which they took out and removed from that location. When they opened up one, they found they were in Aramaic. So Isa Rashid took the scrolls, began a translation process. In something like seven years, he sent Meyer about one-third of these scrolls, translated from the Aramaic, in which they originally were, into German. He let Meyer know that he was now virtually on the run with his family for their lives. He told Meyer that there were certain religious factions of a couple major religions that found out that he had these scrolls and that wanted to take possession of them themselves. The information would prove to be enormously heretical. After Isa Rashid had translated a chunk of them, he took them and his family into a refugee village in Lebanon, hid the scrolls in the walls. It's said that within about a week's time, the Israelis came in and destroyed the entire village. The scrolls were destroyed, along with many of the structures and people who lost their lives. Isa Rashid and his family escaped with their lives into Iraq. And four years later, Meyer found out that Isa Rashid and his entire family had been machine gunned to death, ostensibly by the Mossad in Baghdad. For instance, Emmanuel foretold the coming of another prophet. He named him as Muhammad. He claimed that the, while this man would be a true prophet, his teachings would also be corrupted and a false and evil cult would be created from them that would give the Israeli people, the distant descendants, no peace until the end of time, unless, hopefully, both the Israelis and their enemies could make a conciliatory and honest peace with each other. The Talmud of Emmanuel contains prophecies about the fires that would darken the sky when greedy and power-hungry people would ignite the very oil of the earth. The Talmud Emmanuel was discovered in 1963. The fires from the Gulf War that darkened the skies did not occur until 1991, 18 years after the Talmud was discovered. There are two artifacts that are shown in this book that Meyer discovered in the tomb where the Talmud Emmanuel was discovered. The first one was a small figurine that Meyer says was left by the Indian healers with Emmanuel, the men who came and ministered to him over those three days while he was sequestered in the tomb. The other artifact is a piece of gypsum that Gabriel allegedly gave to Emmanuel. Both of these were left for Meyer to discover, as he did centuries later. When I was in India in 1964, I lived in the Asoka Ashram outside of Morali with a monk named Dharmawara from whom I also learned a great deal. It was then that the opportunity arose for the first time for me to photograph spaceships, that is to say, beam ships. Raumschiffe, respektive Strahlschiffe fotografieren konnte. And that is my grandfather when he was in his late 80s and myself a year and a half before I left to come to United States to pursue my university studies. As I continued my university studies, I have forgotten all about that contact. It never stayed in a place in my mind where it is utilized. I went on finishing my uh, graduate work, went to uh, help my country became a diplomat, was sent back to, um, to New York to represent my country at the United Nations. Worked at it for 12 years. One day I was cleaning and came across the book again. So I thought before I threw it away, I, I should look at it. I opened the page and saw the name Ashoka Ashram. So I was wondering how could our place be named in this book? 
As I browsed through it, I saw the stories. And immediately, I thought, I bet you it was the same Swiss person that had stayed at our place when I was a child. If he's the person that I knew, if he has a monkey, it's the same person. So Wendell wrote to him, and I think Wendell said within an hour, Billy wrote back. A few months later, I flew out. We sat and talked for three straight nights without sleep. It was almost like I felt I have returned home and he felt he has returned home. <laughs> so it was just sharing of some part of him that he has not been able to share so much with a lot of people before. She seems like her, her, her body language is congruent. So it's, it's in other words, when she's speaking, her hands move with with whatever is going on. She's saying, um, I remember this. Typically, if I was lying, I wouldn't throw something like that in because I'm trying to get through it as quick as possible. So she goes into little snippets of the story. I would say that the way she's presenting it, either she's rehearsed it really well or she, this is, she's, she's telling what, what she believes in. So this ship would appear usually would be around the same time as I have the visitation or sometime this was taken by Billy Meyer. It's 1965, it's a very hot day in Turkey. Meyer gets on a bus, sits next to the window, sticks his arm out. When another bus whose driver was drunk drove towards us and rammed us, I was hurled out the window and my left arm was smashed and crushed to such a degree that it had to be amputated. For the next month, he wanders around hallucinating. The police recognize him. They knew him as the Phantom. Instead of shooting him on the spot, they took care of him until he was well enough to proceed on his way. Whereby it must be said that after the accident I first went down to Kuwait delirious. What I had done simply wasn't appropriate. I don't want to be persuaded into talking about it. Askett told me that through this I will learn things with regard to self-control, dealing with my own thoughts and feelings, my psychology and so forth. And it turned out that actually she had been right. I met my wife in Greece after my accident in Iskenderun. The Corinth police helped us get the wedding papers and then we were officially arrested only to be told at the police station, well, you are now married and there is nothing we can hold against you. My decision to marry this girl had to do with an explanation by Asket in the 50s and earlier by Svath that I would meet this girl one day and marry her. And it really turned out that quite bad things resulted and that my marriage wasn't happy and so on and so forth. Askets and Svath's explanation was, were I to marry Calliope, I would settle down and would begin my mission and would perform this mission no matter what. The notion of there was a center didn't even occur to me until I was maybe seven or eight years old. For me it was just a patch of land in the green hills of Switzerland. So I could be here, discover things, discover nature, ask questions about nature and of course there were many people surrounding me from different parts of the world. By, by chance I found a, a book in a, in a shop and um, I, I found it with all the pictures of Billy. The book name was Contact from Pleiades. It was telling all the story of Billy. And I was I was very highly impressed, and then I tried to, to come here to see where where Figo was and and get as many information as possible. My name is Bernadette Brandt. I come actually from Hinterschmidt Rüti. My name is Bernadette Brandt. I actually come from Hinterschmidt Rüti because I've lived here for 30 years. 
Franz had told me amazing things about Billy, but basically I didn't want to meet him. Then I came into a situation where I had to confront him and was unbelievably surprised that he accepted me exactly as I was. I come from the north of Germany. In 1974, my first husband died of cancer. And then I was on a search for the truth, searching for an answer to what is death? In addition, there was the big question, what is the meaning of life? In 1977, I think, I read about him twice in two journals, but did not continue to pay attention to it. I thought such a contact in Switzerland does not appear realistic to me, but for a long time I was interested in extraterrestrial life, reincarnation and related things. I pondered about the meaning of life and then, well, I had once been a member in an American association and read in the newsletter about a Swiss farmer and about a photo book about his contacts with extraterrestrials. Da ist in ein Schweizer Bauer, der hat über diese, von diesem gibt es einen Bildband mit über Kontakte mit Außerirdischen. Ganz einfach, er ist mein Vater. How do you know him? Quite simple, he's my father. Das war schon schwierig, ja, weil... So how was it as a child? That was very difficult because it didn't come just from the children, rather more from the adults who then influenced the children. Especially in the early years, and partly even today, he had a reputation as a nutcase. And there should be no contact with such a person, and this influenced the children. This was expressed in that I was ignored or teased by my classmates. Das war schwer, ja. Yes, that was difficult. I was successful in repressing the memory of this, and I don't mean just in a transferred sense, but really. There are only a few episodes that I still remember from the first 18, 20 years of my life. Bis circa 18, 20 Jahre. Everything else is buried in my subconscious and I've built up my individuality by trying out many things, by getting around a lot, by making the acquaintance of many people, but also by making many mistakes. Did you ever say to your father, Dad, how could you do this, such a hard thing? No, I never asked him personally, but in secret I have often asked myself this question. I tried to analyze the whole situation and to break it down for myself, and I came to the conclusion. And to open for me, and I to the conclusion that it is more important to build up the mission, to build up Figo, than to go into this problem. Die Mission, die Figu aufzubauen, als, äh, ich sage jetzt mal, auf diese Problematik einzugehen. Ich bin meinem Vater auch nicht böse. I'm not angry with my father because of it. Quite the contrary, I'm glad and happy that he is here for me today in this form, and I am trying to profit and learn as much as I can from it. Und ich versuche so viel wie möglich daraus zu profitieren und zu lernen. Meine Mutter hat immer versucht. My mother always tried to drive a wedge between our father and us and tried again and again to incite us against him. Und hat auch immer wieder versucht, uns gegen ihn aufzuhetzen. Das ist aber schlussendlich. Well, she didn't succeed in the end and overall we have a good relationship with our father. He was on the road for 12 years and naturally quite a bit comes together from real life. That fascinated me. The people as such, how they live, how they work, their way of thinking, their hospitality, other countries, other customs, that naturally expands one's horizons when one can experience something like that. Und da ist natürlich auch eine Horizonterweiterung.
diesbezüglich, wenn man sowas erfahren darf. Und dann... And one day the question arose. Jakobus, what do you make of extraterrestrials? Where the road enters the forest, there was a pile of long logs and very good photographs were taken there. Where are we going, Billy? Down to Lower Satellik, where we were able to take photographs of Semyase's beam ship. It was night, and I heard a sound and steps. At that time, I slept in the house trailer when I was over here over the weekends. I went outside because I heard the name Edward, saw a large white haired figure in the half darkness. Actually, it was more the silhouette I could recognize, and I simultaneously perceived I have to retreat, stand still, and go back to the house trailer. It was a wonderful feeling. Somehow, I was inwardly fulfilled with happiness and light and sun and so forth, and naturally, I've never forgotten that. Sonne und weiß ich was erfüllt innerlich, was ich natürlich nie vergessen habe. Ungefähr 1990 habe ich dann die 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 Forschungsschiffe vom Dahl Universum. Around 1990, I saw the ionizing hulls of three research ships from the Dahl Universe. They were circling and looked like misty balls. I've also observed a mass sighting of Asina's people. It was at that time when Asina came to say farewell to Billy. When I could take photographs, it was very unusual that other people, group members, could go with me and take photographs themselves. As a rule, I always had to go alone. And halfway, I suddenly had such a strange feeling, some kind of urge which grew stronger and stronger, and suddenly I knew what I should do. I should look up. There was a huge cauliflower-like cloud, a quite big silvery shining disc curved around the cloud. And suddenly it vanished as if it had been cut out of a film. I had such a wistful feeling in me, something like homesickness. In my thoughts, I was always with this huge ship. Schiffe, UFOs, oder Strahlschiffe, wie sie genannt werden. I had several sightings of ships, UFOs, beam ships as they are called, due to the fact that my father had contact with the Playaren and repeatedly said, I have been called once again. Immer wieder gesagt hat und auch gesagt hat, so jetzt auch, jetzt bin ich wieder gerufen worden. Es war für mich einfach selbstverständlich da. It has been a natural thing as I had been a part of it since childhood. Das war hier auf dem Centergelände. Uh, hat Billy einmal gerufen, wir sollen kommen. It was here on the center's grounds when Billy called that we should come and there was a tiny silvery point in the sky. And I was lucky three times to have had the occasion to photograph three UFOs. Uh, ein Foto zu schießen, wo ein UFO zu sehen ist. Naturally, I didn't see them when I took the photographs, only when I had the photographs in my hand. So it was by coincidence? Yes. Was ich dann aber gesehen habe und was auch auf dem Bild dann drauf ist. While taking the photograph, I saw a fiery red big disc which didn't appear at all on my photograph. But what I also saw, and what was also on the photo, was some glittering drizzle which sprayed down from that disc. Once I was with other witnesses when Semyaze eliminated a freestanding, approximately three to five meter tall fir tree in a meadow, it suddenly disappeared. The apple, which is still preserved today in this glass jar, has been here now for around 30 years. 
In spite of that, in my view, it still looks exactly as good as it did then. We're not just dealing with an ordinary apple, because it was not grown in a terrestrial garden. Rather, it comes from a food garden or a greenhouse. Which is situated in spaceship commander Ishwish Patar's huge mothership. This is what's special about this apple. Unfortunately, almost nobody has accepted this apple story of mine. Back there, long logs were lying where the road curves, and beyond, at the curve just in front of the forest, there where it goes into the forest, I once made recordings of the whirring sounds of Semyaze's beam ship. You could hear it over a very big area, up to a distance of four kilometers. Wendell Stevens, Lee Elders, and Tom Welch got a measuring device from Wild Limited up in Rheintal. A company with electronic devices and measured the distance from here to there about 380 meters, which made it possible for the sounds to be recorded from here. Von hier aus die Geräusche überhaupt noch aufgenommen werden konnten. What's happening is the ten different frequencies are converging on one central frequency which is, I find, very interesting. This is probably one of the most interesting things about the tape, is that there are... What's this right now? Very, very many tones. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they're all changing very fast. Not uh, synthesizers on the market that have oscillators that change that randomly. Even if you got nine or ten of them going, they wouldn't change from those peaks that quickly. So a significant thing is this rate of change. And besides, if you were going to create a noise for a spaceship, it, mm -hmm. you'd be hard put to come up with something as original as this. I would see it once a week or sometimes twice a week, ship over the Ashoka Ashram, but from an angle behind the Ashoka Ashram, there's a little hill, and we used to call it the Dock Hill. This was taken on uh, May 24, 1964. This was taken just on the side towards the east of the ashram. Sometimes I would see more than two, there would be a whole bunch of them. Taken from monuments in that area, it's called the Qutub Minar. This is an old Indian uh, historical monument. Very interesting and also important to me, a whole bunch of them. But this is one of my ayah washing my clothes, sitting on the veranda outside <laughs> my room. When I had my experience, I have seen a lot of ships over the trees, near the well, on the dock house. Sometimes it was very low. I could see a huge half of this room size of the ship. So when I had experiences with Asket, it was also not something very unusual or strange for me. It was almost a return to some familiar state. Sometimes there would be a few uh, villagers walking around and they would look up and see this. In the ashram itself, sometimes our servant would come and said, I saw something very strange. Have you seen? I would say yes, and that was the end of it. <laughs> this is right on top of the ashram in the evening. Sometimes there would be people looking up with me, looking up, and some of them would see the ship very clearly like myself, but some would look at them and said, I don't see it. This is one of the uh, phenomena where hundreds of people saw this. Even was written in the Indian newspaper in the 60s. Actually, one reporter was dispatched from the newspaper, I think the, the New Statesman or something. He came, talked to uh, the villagers, talked to people who work at our place, and, uh, and even talked to Billy and was shown the photos. During my night watch, I parked my car just here, Everything was dark here, and I came walking along this road. 
heraufgelaufen und ich hier so entlang laufe. As I was walking along, Pita and his shiny little ship came over this hill, brightly illuminated between the trees over the tent there. So über das Center, hell beleuchtet. Die ganze Situation nach bald 20 Jahren ist etwas derartig Normales. Dass the whole situation after 25 years is somewhat normal and we deal with such unusual phenomena quite differently. Im Februar, das war, ich schätze 2001, ich habe es mal aufgeschrieben. I had another interesting experience. I guess it was in February 2001. I wrote about it. I drove my car into the protection shield of a telemeter disc. Mit meinem Auto und da wurde das ganze Auto wurde in einen riesigen Lichtball. That means that I touched the electroenergetic protection shield of that disc with my car, and the whole car was enveloped in a huge ball of light. Mit meinem Auto es war ein helles orange leuchtendes Licht und an der Peripherie meines Fahrzeuges konnte ich It was as if my car and I were struck by a very strong electrical tension. Elektrische Ladung entlädt rund um mein Fahrzeug. Mitte der 80er Jahre war ich in Italien in den Ferien. In the mid 80s I was on vacation in Italy and one night about 11 I had an impulse and I looked and there were two lights quite parallel very fast and then they whoosh parted and then I knew ja, das war es. Ja, das war es jetzt. Also, Außerirdische habe ich sicher noch nicht gesehen. <lacht> Raumschiffe, ja, also irgendwas. I've certainly never yet seen extraterrestrials. But spaceships, ja, yeah, something silvery in the sky. Well, I have to say that I have simply never been interested in spaceships. Spaceships are, for me, like cars. I'm not interested in cars either. They are a means of transportation. But what has always been clear to me, and what I never quite realized, was that it was clear to me that, logically, there are extraterrestrials. We here on Earth certainly are not the only ones in this huge universe. So, Mike, what's this photograph that we see here? This is a photograph that Billy Meyer took in 1975 of a landed UFO, the only one of this type that he was able to take. It was from this photograph that the special effects expert, Wally Gentleman, who had been a director of special effects in 2001, designed and had made two UFO models at the MGM special effects studio. In, in these photographs, we see Billy Meyer with those models. You mean 2001, the, the Kubrick film? Yes. And what's the difference between these models versus, you know, photographs that Billy Meyer took of actual UFOs? Well, I think we're going to take a look at some of that. For instance, here we can see in this film the model, uh, one of the models being handheld and walked about the property. There were very specific technical dif differences that were observed. But in this film, we see an object that some people might say is a model. It's hovering above what appears to be a tree and in front of a house. Is this uh, one of uh, his films? Or? This is one of Billy Meyer's films, his earliest film from 1975. Some people would think by a string, but as you see this move off to the side, you notice the UFO hung for a moment at an angle, which is something that's impossible to affect with an object on a string. But it looks like so shaky and like being pulled up and down. Yes. I mean, is this the usual way they fly? No, this was a demonstration flight. And some of what was accomplished here was the characteristic and to be expected movements would come from an object, a pendulum-like object, an object on a string. And then we see these other smooth and flowing movements as the UFO is moving about the tree. We're told that this was done for a couple of reasons. One, to actually demonstrate flight in a terrestrial environment, and two, to also give an out to skeptics who would have to say this cannot be an object from outer space, it would be too threatening to their belief systems. However, at a certain point, we can actually see the top of this tree swaying under the backwash of the UFO. And if we look back at the very opening of this film, we will notice that there's a great deal of space between the UFO and the sky making it very, very unlikely that it could be an object suspended on a string. And why is this film so, like, blurry and, like, looks like an old film? I mean, what Well, is it? it is an old film, shot in 1975 on a snowy and rainy day, according to Meyer, and shot from a distance. So what we're seeing here is uh, a, a rather poor quality film, to be sure, 
and we're just having to make the best of it ourselves in our understanding. Is this tree still there today? The tree is no longer there, as is the case in a, in a couple of uh, the other films and photographs that Meyer took. And what do we see here? Here is a clearer, a much clearer film segment that Meyer took with a UFO hovering above a road. And we can see a car moving slowly to the left in the bottom. Oh, yeah, of that white front. dot there, yeah. The white dot. We're going to see another one in a moment. We also notice that there is a tree branch with some leaves to the left. Meyer was encouraged oftentimes to have objects in the foreground for perspective and, and calculating the distance. Here the craft has moved suddenly to the left and it's exhibiting a characteristic floating motion that we're told is really the craft riding on the magnetic field of the Earth. In this film we can see an object, uh, a, a toy made in the 1990s invented by physicists called a Levitron that exhibits this type of movement as this object in these repeated frames floats above the base. We we dissolve here into Meyer's UFO as it too is exhibiting that type of hovering pulsing movement on the magnetic field of the earth as he was told. Now watch as the object will suddenly dart away in one frame disappearing from view. How is that possible? Meyer was told that they have technologies that allow them to move out of phase, out of dimension within a part of a second. They can not only move out of dimension that quickly, they can also pop back into dimension. When the films were examined at Nippon TV, they discovered that indeed there had been no cutting and that the object not only disappears in one frame, but pops back in in one frame just as suddenly as you see here. So where does it go while it's gone? Well, that's a good question. As we observe it here disappear one more time, we can wonder just exactly where it goes. I don't have an answer for it. That's Billy Meyer in the lower uh, middle of the film. He's walked into the film. He'd set up his camera on a tripod as we again see one of the UFOs hovering in the distance. And again, notice that it has this movement, the slight pulsing up and down movement as it rides on the magnetic field of the Earth. And this film? This film, Meyer has the UFO as it comes in closer. He also zooms in on it a bit. And we will see two very dramatic effects of a light flashing there from the ah, top. There, yeah. You see it? And then from the rim of the ship. Why, why is it flashing like that? That was not explained. As a matter of fact, when Meyer mentioned it to them, uh, to the extraterrestrials, they were surprised at that effect. And they wanted to see the film too. We, we see it again go on there. Now, as you watch this film, in a moment you're going to be able to observe more clearly that the craft is actually above the earth. There's a, a bit of a hill or mountain uh, just below the time codes there. So clearly this was photographed outside. This was filmed outside. And this is one of the films that the owners of Uncharted Territory, the Academy Award winning special effects house, uh, they viewed this film and determined that it was not a hoax. In this film, we see three of the UFOs, again in the distance, with, with tree branches in the foreground, as they hover at slightly different angles in relationship to each other, exhibiting again the pulsing movement and changing distance ever so minutely between them. Uncharted Territory said that if they could duplicate Meyer's films, they would have to go to CGI to do it, because these clearly are not models. And what is this right here? This is the beginning of a series of photographs that Meyer took of what's called a light or energy ship, allegedly piloted by beings from the Andromeda galaxy who are partially physical and partially non-physical, very high-level, high-energy beings. They did not communicate directly with Meyer, and he could not communicate with them. Interestingly enough, Lee and Britt Elders, two of the original investigators on the case, claimed that they also saw a phenomenon in the night skies like this in Switzerland while they were investigating the case. Photoshop expert David Biedney claimed that Meyer had simply used a light fixture photographed against a black background to hoax these photographs, in particular one that he claimed was a double exposure. 
when another special effects movie expert who'd been in the business for 50 years viewed the same photograph that we're about to see in just a moment, he said that it was not a double exposure at all, but a triple exposure that must have been taken accidentally in camera. When Mr. Biedny was challenged to duplicate this photo to prove his point, he declined to even try. Is it this photograph right here? This is the one. Now, in the next one, this one, which is clearly not a double exposure, Mr. Biedny wouldn't even comment on it. This poses a problem for the skeptics because it clearly was not done outside the camera. And what is this thing that looks so interesting? Well, that's our wedding cake UFO. This was the only other landed UFO that Meyer was able to take photographs of. And interestingly enough, in very much the same location as the energy ship when it was photographed uh, in the previous photographs right above the center. We see here a more clear view of the base of the ship taken from this angle. And as we get closer to it, even a little more clarity. These photos of the wedding cake UFO were called hoaxes by many people who thought that it was merely a garbage can lid with various appliances and, and uh, accessories somehow put onto it. However, when the original investigators were able to calculate the measurement, it turned out to be some 10 feet in diameter. When they took these photos to a metallurgist to ask if he could reproduce it in 1980 or 81, he said it would cost about $25,000 to make this object. Here, an even larger wedding cake UFO is photographed over a van on Meyer's property, and Meyer photographs it as well from underneath. These are very controversial photographs of the wedding cake UFO glowing a golden color at night. Here you can see various artifacts, trees, and perhaps light poles in the background. In this next photograph, Meyer has a close-up of it, even larger, closer to the camera. And here, a telemeter disc moves off to the side, and the photograph of the tree and the car caused problems for skeptics who claim that this is really just a model tree and a model car. Here we can see the most dramatic of those photos as Meyer photographs focusing on the distant large UFO which is behind the car and not in front of it. Here the object is now clearer, hovering, and we can see the base of the UFO at night as it glows golden color with various protuberances underneath. In this next photograph, the center or the core, the top core of the UFO, the sleeve has been extended. If you take your time to do some measurements on it, you'll see that it's actually a different configuration. When was this video taken? This was taken in 1981, outside. Meyer has the uh, camera set up. This is his first video camera. And the UFO here is about two to 300 feet in the distance, as best we can calculate. Meyer snaps some of the photographs here. He'll then leave the frame. He'll go out of frame again for a while before coming back in. Some skeptics had claimed that this was really false perspective, that it was a small model tree set up close to the camera. For anybody that's been to Switzerland, rural parts as well, and especially uh, near where Meyer lives, many solitary trees appear on these hillsides, and they look uh, all too, too good to be true, unless you're familiar with the fact that there's a very vibrant life force, the trees are clear, solitary in many occasions. Here, this solitary tree has the UFO hovering virtually motionlessly in front of it. How is that possible in the other films? It was moving here, it's like standing still. Well, it seems that the UFOs can be controlled consciously by the Playaren. People have to think that through for themselves and see if they accept that idea. These are the only known photographs taken from within a UFO above the earth with two other UFOs visible. Meyer took these from inside Semyaze's ship. In this final photograph, we even get a clearer view of the earth and land below. With any technology that I know of could not achieve this on this earth plane. I could not explain the type of material that I have and its discreteness by any known combination of materials. I could not put it together myself. The elements that we found were totally surprising. The major element which is shown here was the rare earth metal tholmium, T H U L I U M. It was totally unexpected. So now we've seen silicon, iron, tholmium, 
silver and copper, all in a specimen about this big. When he examined the metal under electron scanning microscope, he then found the micro machining, which was a clear evidence to him that this was a deliberately manufactured product. We found evidence of what looks like mechanical manipulation. Mm -hmm. One sees now discrete marks in a diagonal form in this direction and marks in this direction. But what is exciting, it looks like it's been plowed. In other words, a pressure and there is a scar uh, scarfing on either side. Do we know what this metal is used for? We're told that these metals were representative of a number of the different stages, seven stages of manufacturing that the Playaren go through to create the metal for their spacecraft. I don't know how beneficial it would be for us. Uh, we, they're always more advanced than we are, so we're the savages in the jungle, and that's not always beneficial for the, the, the lesser uh, evolved person. Uh, but they're here. They're here studying us, and uh, we should know about it, I think. If these ETs exist, why haven't they contacted us? Well, actually, uh, there's two answers. Number one is they certainly did try to contact us, meaning the government of the United States, in 1979. There was a letter sent to the Carter administration. But when I read that letter, I really understood why the contact didn't take place. It really was demanding such profound changes in the consciousness of people in this country that there was really no chance that they were going to go for it. Specifically, that President Carter and his administration reveal to the American people that all of the religious beliefs here are based on uh, fantasy, nonsense, and lies. All the world coverage of this case became a milestone in ufology. And of course, the wonderful pictures and movies. For the first time, we had a strong documented cases with strong evidences, hard evidences in video, in photographs, physics solid materials from another world to analyze and also scores of uh, testimonials by Billy Mayer of uh, his contacts. So I think uh, this is, uh, at this moment, this is, is, is a legend in ufology. Throughout history, we know there have been lots of times when, you know, the world has believed, for example, that it was flat and then it was discovered that it wasn't and it only took maybe one or two people to believe that. So it's what we call a type 2 error in research. In other words, uh, that you reject something that, is actu that actually is true. The teaching of the spirit or the knowledge that is transmitted to us by the Pleiaren is so fundamentally different from everything else here on Earth. Was ich von Sfort gelernt habe von der ersten playarischen Person, mit der ich in Kontakt bin. What I learned from Sfort, the first Playaren contact person, and that I could then process everything and go around the world with the help of the Playaren. And the great amount I also learned out there in the world, and the great knowledge I could draw from the storage banks and also that from my own thinking, my own realizations, I could then start to fulfill the mission. All of this wasn't simply information being given to me, rather I had to work for it all by myself. The German language is the best language that one can actually have in the world in order to precisely and clearly explain everything just as it really must be. What we are disseminating from here, the center in Hinterschmidruti, is simply only a teaching. And we call that the teaching of the spirit, or spiritual teaching, or the teaching of truth. Consciousness-related evolution is the real meaning of life. About 400 different texts, about 40 books, and 3,000 copies are printed of each book, which makes 120,000 books.
Das Universum, das ist schon... Äh, The universe is already very, very old, and everything took its time to come into being, even human life. The beginning is the cause from which the effect came about. It's the law of causality which has to take effect. The meaning of life is the human being's evolution with regard to his consciousness. Gott, das ist eine imaginäre Gestalt, die die Menschen geschaffen haben. Billy, what is God? God is an imaginary figure which has been created by human beings so they don't have to bear responsibility themselves. Rather, they can shift it onto a deity. But God, in and of itself, is nothing other than a title for a human being who is very highly evolved. Gott ist also nicht das, was die Menschen uh, irrtümlich annehmen. God is therefore not what human beings wrongly assume, that he is the creator, the creator of life, the creator of a universe, of space. God is nothing other than a title, be it Allah or Shiva, etc. The human being always tries to set a power above himself and he calls it God. This God or this power is supposed to be responsible for him and everything and anything that he says, does, thinks and feels and so forth, and for his fate. The human being is solely responsible for each and everything he thinks, does, feels and undertakes. He must be responsible for it. He must bear and savor all the positive and negative which he processes through his thoughts, actions and feelings. It's good that he invented a new term called creation, which is, I think, a bit, yeah, maybe a bit broader. Innocent as well, you know, if you say God or Allah, then, you know, there is a long heritage you know, of, of maybe violent history attached to it. So maybe let's call it creation. Then. They want, simply want us to look at the facts and learn to understand the truths. The Palladians said there are no earth religions that are valid, that they are all dogmas created by men to create men. We don't need an intercessor and we shouldn't be taking anybody else's ideas about religion. It's all internal. Everybody has his own contact with the creation. Because in various cultures from the Middle East, South and Central Americas and India, etc., all of the gods of the past were extraterrestrial humans. Many of them were the forefathers of the Pleiaren. Because their ancestors set in motion these religions, which have led to many of the problems we face today, they want to help us. But this time they must do so without directly interfering with us, because that would only lead to their being worshipped again or to their being attacked. When we think about God and religion and the universe, we might want to consider that we, we live in a little ball. Actually, if we put it in perspective, we live on a piece of cosmic lint, somehow magically suspended in space, perfect operation, everything's going on. In religion, we want to say that God is responsible for that and that we should also fear God or maybe we won't be sitting on a cloud after we die, we'll be dipped eternally in molten lava not exactly a positive image. And so, on one hand, we have the spiritual teachings from Meyer and the various religions of our world. To understand the difference between them, we really have to look at both. Then the human beings are no longer in a position to think for themselves. They still only think in the framework prescribed by religions, sects, philosophies and ideologies. Der Mensch muss aber aus sich selbst heraus seine Gedanken pflegen. Seine but the human beings must nurse their thoughts from within themselves. They have to learn their thoughts and create the respective feelings. And it is only then that they may detach themselves from that which the false teachings, the erroneous teachings, which hammering fear into them, are bringing. Ihren Andenken, dass man mir mit einem Nagel an die Haustüre genagelt hat, es langt doch. Here is a memento for me that someone nailed on the door of the house. It's enough, you dog, you will be put down. Shortly after this note was nailed on the door, a couple of days later, it came to a head, and someone shot at me once again and tried to kill me. Und hier ist der Platz, 
als ich einmal hier zu einem Kontakt gehen. And here is the place that I was once supposed to come for a contact. Jakobus was with me and two other men. In the hours of the night, someone shot at me from down there. Hat man auf mich geschossen. Das habe ich aber Tage zuvor geträumt. I dreamed about it days before and had hung a metal plate in front of my chest under my jacket and on top of it a memorandum book. And the bullet went through the book and into the metal plate and so my life was saved through a dream that I had had before. Because I have dreams again and again which show me things that will happen in the future. Can we all have such dreams? Can we all have such dreams? Actually, everybody can have such dreams if they concentrate on them and begin to steer their dreams and when they enable themselves to somehow have visions through dreams, dream visions, prophetic dreams and so on and so forth. But that naturally requires that the human concentrates and uses his consciousness to really make use of the energies and forces which arise from it. Meyer is not a pacifist. His position is that self-defense is a basic human right but that weapons may only be used if there's absolutely no other way to defend one's own life or someone else's. Even then, killing someone in self-defense should be the absolute last resort, so going to war or attacking other persons who do not directly threaten oneself or others is not self-defense, but a punishable crime. My weapons. This is my son's army pistol. In Switzerland, the Swiss soldiers have their weapons at home. Small caliber rifles, two submachine guns, two Kalishnikovs, and here is my revolver, 22 millimeter. And this is my second army weapon, 9 millimeter, 44 magnum, bulldog revolver. Why do you have all these weapons? I actually carried these weapons earlier during night watches and for the job I had, for security, transporting money and so forth. Wouldn't you say it's a bit aggressive or even provocative to hoard so many revolvers, so many weapons? No. And this is my army pistol. What do the Pleiarans say about self-defense? And what about carrying weapons? Self-defense with weapons is actually only appropriate if it effectively involves defending a life. I see myself quite simply as a teacher, as a herald, even if they say that I am a prophet. And I simply see myself as a quite normal human being. The silent revolution of truth actually is exactly the appropriate name for what we are doing here. First of all, it has to do with self-responsibility and that the human being learns to go back to his roots without any compulsion and learns to be a human being. The Pleiarn say that they know, not believe, but know that there's such a thing called the human spirit. And there is a soul, but the soul is a transitory element of human being, kind of located in the solar plexus primarily, and it dissolves after death. Let's get back to the human spirit. That is the eternal and immortal part of us. There's a physical location for it, which is deep within the brain. They claim that they know this to be true, and that they also know that people live numerous lives. We're talking about millions and millions of different incarnations. So if, in terms of reincarnation, we might have a slogan that says, don't worry about dying, you'll live through it. In living through it, it means that you actually are born again into a different personality. They know, therefore, scientifically, that the human spirit comes into the fetus at the third week, the 21st day. Therefore, they allow abortion up until that point, but they don't allow it afterwards because they consider that that would be murder. So in our world, because we don't know for certainty that there is a human spirit, 
we don't know that there is reincarnation, we either believe it or we don't, we are polarized. Those people who believe that abortion is okay under any conditions and those who believe that it isn't under any conditions. Both sides are actually right and both sides are wrong. Once we know scientifically that there is a human spirit and when it comes and attaches to the embryo, we would resolve that polarization just as the Pleiaren apparently have. Dies hier, das ist der Lebensbaum. Und der hat sein this here is the tree of life and its branches are pointing upwards. But what's declared to be the peace symbol these days is the rune designating death. In other words, people use the sign upside down and it doesn't mean peace, it means death. The apostles of peace around the world even painted on their faces. This sign, the death sign, has exactly the opposite effect of to live, of everything growing upwards. Everything must flourish, everything must grow. According to these teachings, actually, the core problem is overpopulation. Because we are pressing against our environment and each other, causing enormous problems. Our environmental problems are largely due to the abuse, degradation, and overuse of the environment. Uh, Meyer has been writing about this since 1951. Global warming, which is a natural occurrence to a certain degree, is now three to one, 75 percent human caused, largely due to overpopulation. It also produces another problem, which is illegal immigration. When people in a country have not attained economic and educational standards, productivity, at a certain level that they crave, they will migrate into another country where that accomplishment is present and they want to take advantage of that system. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It's an impersonal thing. It simply means that they are not prepared to solve their own problems. They will therefore start to degrade the very system that they come in and take advantage of. They don't help their home country, so they actually betray their responsibility to bringing themselves and their countrymen, their, their land, up to the level that they would aspire to have. Illegal immigration sets up strife, famine, wars, civil unrest. So when the Playaren said years and years ago, decades ago, that the United States will suffer two civil wars, one following the other, I laughed at it until I start to look now at the problems that we are recognizing in our own country due to illegal immigration. What's the solution to overpopulation, Michael? According to the information of this case, a cessation of births, very simply, there is a staggered means of introducing births into a society once it has attained a reasonable level of population. What would you say about the relationship between a man and a woman? How does it really work? An interpersonal relationship between a man and a woman must naturally be defined according to what the personal circumstances are with the two people. An interpersonal relationship can simply be from human to human, in which everything becomes valid, as we have often already said, such as love, empathy, freedom, peace and harmony. Then there are also interpersonal relationships which reach very much further, and indeed to the extent that a friendship comes about whereby all these values become very much deeper. And then there is a further possibility where the two build up a lifelong union together, where man and woman live together as life partners. It's all the same if they are married according to legal values, as the authorities require it here on earth, or if a free life partnership exists, which luckily is feasible and allowed in our latitudes or in the Western world. Um, you have something to say to that, Michael? No? About men and women living yeah. together? I am not an expert in that area. Billy, how do you see the rest of the world coming to terms with your teachings? How can that come about? When we are talking about the rest of the world, beyond our center here and beyond our Figu community, 
It can only come about the same way that a small snowball rolling down a hill will accumulate more and more snow and grow bigger and bigger. That means that the people who come to us and understand what we teach and also make the effort themselves to transform what they learn into reality will further carry it to their neighbors, acquaintances and friends and so forth. And in this way, everything slowly spreads out. Perhaps the most startling of what I call the prophetically accurate information in the Meyer case pertains to Meyer's astronomical information about numerous planets, but especially Jupiter, its rings, its moons. Meyer specifically said that Io was the most volcanically active body in the solar system. He published that five months before we discovered it. More than a year after he published the information on a ring of Jupiter being composed of ionized sulfur particles, Science Magazine published that information in January of 1980. Most impressively, when I sent Meyer's information about Io being the most volcanically active body in the solar system, as published by Meyer five months before the probe got there, Professor Joseph Viverka, the head of the astronomy department at Cornell University, said the following to me, and I quote, If he, Meyer, said that three to six months before, then all I can say is that he was right. In 1958, he publishes a letter in which he foretells two U.S. wars with Iraq. The second one, he claims, will lead to an unbelievable disaster. He names AIDS as a coming epidemic. He names crystal meth as a coming drug epidemic. He specifically foretells computers, credit cards, the dates of various events such as moon landings and rocket launches, years and decades before these things occur. So what do people do about it? The problem is that we, the people of Earth, do not learn from prophecies and predictions. We do not seem to have the common sense, let alone the wisdom, to take the warning about things that are going to occur. You see, prophecies and predictions really are the manifestation of the law of cause and effect. That means that that which you send out will come back. What about the future, Michael? We're being told that we are leaving an age, an age of beliefs and we're entering an age of knowledge. It's a difficult transition, this movement into the future. It's going to be uncomfortable because we've relied so much on belief and not enough on knowledge. If you get on an airplane, you're gonna fly somewhere, do you want to know that the pilot believes he can fly the plane or that he knows how to fly? We've been given a weather report. Prophecies and predictions, the difference between the two, prophecies are the likely outcomes of events that are in motion, the effects of causes if we don't rectify them, we get this negative outcome called a third world war. Predictions are things that the player and claim are set in stone and they usually relate to more cosmic events, a planetary body, a meteor coming through, a volcanic eruption or an earthquake that has nothing to do with human activity. In terms of the things that we're most concerned about, a third world war, or terrorism, let's take the third world war. It's not written in stone. It's just that it's a high probability unless we as human beings go right back to this core principle and take responsibility for our thoughts. Do we want to keep seeing the world in this way? Do we want to empower people who are gonna lead us in these dead end directions that only lead to destruction? Here's an unfortunate truth. Our country, the United States, in the past 60 some years has launched over 200 unprovoked attacks against other people. The law of cause and effect tells us that sooner or later that pendulum comes back and it comes back as a wrecking ball. The war against terrorism will not be won militarily not through aggression against people who had nothing to do with it, not through recruiting more terrorists by bombing innocent people. The way they recommend, and they say it's an age, age, age old solution, that all countries on earth must contribute equally to a true peace combat force. This is a force of armed soldiers under true international law that are sent in to put down terrorism, insurrections, wars and criminality and aggression we could put down this type of terrorism in a very short order. Do we have the will and do we have the wisdom to do that? True leadership from here on only comes from the bottom up. It's not going to come to us from the top down. 
we are in a, in a time of false leadership. If we recognize a person of integrity who stands for truth and is willing to buck the tide of all the pressures, political, religious, and everything else, yes, we should support that person. As it said, it will be later on in time the true mothers of the millennium who will bring peace and harmony. The women will come into their true feminine power, not the, the imitation of male power. They will be in balance with that, and they will bring that element strongly forward so that peace will come. As we go into this new time, structures are dissolving and they're falling apart. But that sounds like doom and gloom. It isn't really. It's that the seeds of a new time, the seeds of new understanding and harmony and peace, are developing in the fertilizer, if you will, of these very, very difficult times that we're in. Wenn ich darüber nachdenke, was sich ergeben hat, When I ponder the negative and positive which have occurred in my life, I have to say that I realize it is necessary that the human being experiences both, the bad as well as the good. I think if we embrace the idea that we are going to courageously move forward to discover how we can bring about the kind of harmony that all, every human being craves within themselves. We will awaken to this age of knowledge and to all of the parts of it that would come with it. This isn't just about ETs and UFOs, as fascinating as that is. It's about us and our future survival. The more I read, the more I felt that I had a personal mission to help prove a lot of these prophecies wrong by instilling some hope and directing people to think for themselves so that we can leave a world for our children that's going to be a lot better than the one we're living in now. If this all turns out to be a hoax, what would you say? Well, for me, I'd only have one question, and that would be, how did he do it? <laughs>